I really was thinking that our speaker uh, has been for me like a breath of uh, fresh air, which uh, we all desperately are looking for right now. Uh, but she really is this way, and uh, I'm, I'm always glad to have someone from our faculty and our administration here just uh, to tell you a bit about how God has worked in their lives. This is a, especially a family kind of time. And uh, Kirsten Moore is our uh, women's basketball coach and the uh, assist, our associate uh, athletic director, and uh, truly a breath of fresh air. I'm going to pray for uh, Kirsten. She's really excited. She's got a lot of good things to say, and uh, come over here. Okay, we won't, we won't touch too close. It's awfully hot, but I'm going to... But Lord, uh, behold your servant and your daughter. And Lord, I pray that she will run down the path you set for her this morning because you've set her heart free. Uh, I pray she'll speak in the power of your spirit and with the joy and the love of your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm on. It's great. Um, Joel and worship team, thanks especially for that last song. Um, that song, Inside Out, just, uh, whoo, it gets me every time as I share my story with you guys today. You'll know why, but hopefully uh, I can hold it together here. Um, you know, for five years, this is my sixth year here at Westmont now, and i uh, been coming to chapel, and I always feel sorry for the people who have to speak on hot days. Not only is it because, you know, people up in the bleachers and stuff are falling asleep and uh, can barely stay awake, but um, the flies up here are usually, you know, like they're going like this the whole time. So, y'all have to work with me here, and uh, if those little, you know, bugs start to come around, you can like pray them away for me so that uh, they're not too distracting, so. Um, I've been a Christian for 15 years now. And I always marvel when I hear dramatic conversion stories of when someone's messed up, made some bad choices, hit rock bottom, and then God rescues them from the pit of despair into a new life in Christ. You know, God is in the business of changing lives, and it's so amazing to hear people proclaim, as David did in Psalm 40, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. I think of my friend who, after wasting away to almost nothing due to an eating disorder, found acceptance in God's unconditional love, which allows her to see herself as beautifully and wonderfully made. I recently heard a man tell of how, in his youth, he had spiraled into alcoholism and drug addiction, and when at the end of his rope, repented, God saved him, and now he impacts lives for the kingdom daily. Or what about Paul of Tarsus, who after years of intensely persecuting Christians, has an encounter with God on the road to Damascus, is blinded for three days, then the scales fall from his eyes, he repents, believes, is baptized, and is God's chosen instrument to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, these are some amazing stories. But those are not my stories. In fact, my story is quite the opposite. It was in my moment of my greatest achievement that God found me. It was in my quest to do everything right and be the best that the world had to offer that God offered me more. Okay, so now you have a taste for the end of the story. Girl achieves her dream, realizes this can't be all there is to life, and God shows her more than she could have asked or imagined. You know, growing up, <clears throat> I was always but perplexed by my dad's habit of reading the last page of a book first. Like he'd literally just open up a book from the back cover and read the last page. My rationale was, why in the world would you want to spend time reading a book if you already know the ending? Well, my dad, on the other hand, he reasoned that if the ending wasn't good, then it wasn't worth his time reading it in the first place. So this morning, I'm kind of giving in to my dad's way of thinking, because it's my hunch that here at Westmont, with its high academic and moral standards, there are a lot of people in this gym on the path to success. And I hope that my story helps you and I alike find the fulfillment that we are all hoping for when we reach our goals. 
But now that you have a taste for the end, let's jump back to the beginning of the story. You know, ever since I remember, I've had a passion for sports. In fact, my first word was ball. Yeah, I don't remember that, but that's what my parents tell me. I spent my childhood tagging along with my older brother, playing sports with the big boys, and therefore finding great success against kids my own age. Before long, I developed an insatiable thirst to be the best in whatever I did. In school, I strived to get 100% on every test, on every assignment. In sports, I not, not only wanted to be the best girl at whatever we were playing, but I wanted to beat the boys too. Anything short of perfection was unacceptable in my eyes and only pushed me to work harder and to be better. In the fourth grade, my classmates gave me the nickname Limp. It stood for Little Miss Perfect. <laughs> As if I didn't put enough pressure on myself to already be the best, everyone was now expecting me to be perfect. It's kind of ironic that the two girls that gave me that nickname ended up going to Stanford, but that's not the point. When we got a, a test back in class, you know, everyone would, would ask me, you know, well, what would you get? Because, uh, you know, it would be great as long as they beat Little Miss Perfect. That was a good thing, you know. It made someone's day if they beat me in tetherball or foursquare, you know, you get the idea. The only option for me was to succeed all the time in everything that I did. For Christmas one year, I got a book about a young woman overcoming any obstacle that came in her way to achieve her dream. My parents had written in the front cover, to Kirsten, who can be anything she wants to be. The American dream in words that would motivate me and give me hope for years to come. In the sixth grade, I heard a Stanford women's basketball athlete uh, talk about what it was like to be a collegiate student athlete and a dream was born to play basketball in the Pac-10. My middle school and high school years were consumed working towards my goal of playing Pac-10 basketball and living up to my nickname, Limp. And although I obviously wasn't perfect, I did a pretty good darn, darn good job of it and headed off to play Pac-10 basketball at the University of Oregon. And then a funny thing happened. There I was, living my dream, and yet, I wasn't satisfied. This couldn't really be all that life was about, could it? My aha moment came in the middle of my freshman year. I'd been invited by a senior girl on the softball team to come to an Athletes in Action Bible study. It was there that I heard Danny O'Neill, our quarterback on the football team, share about his Rose Bowl experience. See, he'd grown up in Southern California playing sports with a dream to play in the Rose Bowl on New Year's Day. Well, not only did he play, but he was named Rose Bowl MVP. Yet he shared with us that as he lay in bed that night after the game, he realized that as fun as that experience was, the world will ultimately let you down. I since heard a quote by Ravi Zacharias that summed up what Danny had experienced. The quote said, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just accomplished that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has let you down. I'll say that again. The loneliest moment in life is when you have just accomplished that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has let you down. So there Danny was. He'd just accomplished everything that I was trying to do. Earn a starting position at Oregon and win a Pac-10 championship. And he was saying that it wasn't going to bring lasting fulfillment. He confirmed my suspicion. There had to be more to it. So I set on on a journey for truth. Did God even exist? And if there was a God, which God was the right God? We didn't have classes on apologetics, world religions, or the other things that you all have the opportunity to take here at Westmont. So I went to the library, and I checked out books on many different religions to see what these books had to say about God. I was particularly challenged by a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. The book was so long, it's now actually published in two volumes, so needless to say, there was a lot in there. But the part that really hit home with me was that it showed a substantial amount of compelling evidence that Jesus Christ really did resurrect from the dead. Well, long story short, or as my players sometimes say, long story long, my journey led me to the foot of the cross, 
where I gave up my pride in being perfect and accepted God's offer of perfection through Christ. Understanding and embracing God's unconditional love gave me a freedom I'd never experienced. Freedom to take my eyes off of myself and my need to be number one and to put them on God, his purposes, and his people. Which brings me to my counterculture thought for you. You know, that is the theme of chapel, counterculture. And here's my thought. Your dreams, even if you achieve them, will ultimately let you down unless they are of eternal value. Growing up in America, we've been indoctrinated with the idea of the American dream. The idea that freedom includes a promise of prosperity and success if we work hard and believe. According to Wikipedia, you know, that like, you know, that always tells the truth, right? Okay. So I looked up there, what do they have to say about the American dream? And today's ethos of the American dream simply indicates the ability through participation in the society and economy for everyone to achieve prosperity. That idea of the American dream is really rooted in the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence, which states, and you guys have all heard this, you probably learned it in like second grade, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our founding fathers all plainly believe that this is what God desires for us, his creation. I was the poster child for the American dream as I pursued life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with a relentless work ethic and unswerving optimism. Yet, there was a foundational flaw to my American dream. It was all focused on me. It's humbling to tell you how God taught me this truth. I'd been a Christian for a couple years already, but when it came to my dream, I'd worked way too hard to give that one up to God. My junior year at Oregon was gonna be my breakout season. I'd earned a starting position off and on my sophomore year, and after a summer of hard work, I was determined to be a key contributor in our quest for a Pac-10 championship as an upperclassman. But it was only a couple games into the season and I found myself lying in a hospital bed after an emergency appendectomy as my team moved on without me at practice. After a lengthy recovery rebuilding my strength, I was back out there on the court trying to regain my position. However, it didn't seem to matter how well I played in practice. We were in the middle of Pac-10 season. Coach had her rotation. She was comfortable with it and I wasn't in it. Needless to say, I was pretty excited when the Washington State Cougars rolled into Matt Court. They had a firm hold on last place in the conference. We were good, they were not, and we were gonna crush this team, which meant I was gonna get to play and have a chance to prove myself. Sure enough, we put a beating on the Cougars, had a 30-point lead shortly into the second half, yet there on the bench I stayed, and stayed, and stayed. The clock counted counted down to five minutes, three minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and finally coach looks down the bench and subs me into the game. Well, the next part of the story is quick because all it consisted of of was us dribbling out the clock, and then the game was over, and then we went down to the locker room to celebrate. Well, it was all I could do to hold back my tears of frustration. Sure enough, um... You know, the most selfish thing in sports is to cry after a 30-point win because you didn't get to play. I bit my lip as coach gave her post-game speech and then I headed for the locker room. I was gonna grab my bag and get out of there just as quick as I could because I didn't wanna see my teammates, or my teammates to see me cry. And right as I grabbed my bag, the freshman whose locker was right next to mine says to me, hey Kirsten, can I ask you a question? I kind of nod my head, you know, that when you're about to cry and you try and talk, it's going to happen, right? So I'm not going to talk. So I'm like, okay, sure. And uh, she says, I was just wondering, how do you go out every day in practice and you play better than me? You beat me out up there 
And yet, when it comes to the games, I get to play in front of you, and you still cheer for me. How do you do it? Well, it wasn't God's audible voice to Paul on the road to Damascus, but it was like I was struck by a lightning bolt of truth. Like God shouted down to me, hey, Kirsten, it's not about you. You have a platform as an athlete to share my love with others and to have a positive impact on people's lives. Well, I was able to share with my teammate that night about the treasure I have in jars of clay and that all-surpassing power she saw in me was from God and not from myself. And that that is how I was able to cheer for her. That night began a transformation in me as I realized that the true fulfillment of the American dream is not found in myself, but in Christ. Life. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Liberty. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. And the pursuit of happiness, when Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So where has that left me? Without any dreams? Absolutely not. In fact, if you were to look at my life from the outside, my life might not look that differently than it did before I was a Christian. I still work my hardest to be successful in whatever I do. I still want to win a championship. It's just a GSAC championship instead of a Pac-10 one. But I'm here to tell you that on the inside, everything is different. Everything is different. My motivation is different. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For Christ's love compels us that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I no longer want to succeed because I want to be the best, but so that God would be glorified and along the way myself and others would grow closer to him. Everything is different. There is freedom now in the journey because I already have the victory. Christ has set me free from performance-based approval. So I can cry out with Paul as he does in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So I continue to work hard in freedom, knowing that regardless of the end result, the work is not in vain. God will be glorified and people's lives will be positively impacted. Everything is different. My source of strength is different. The stress I put myself under trying to live up to perfection disappears when I acknowledge that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in me. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Even in my weakness, he is strong. Simply put, everything is different. So today, I want to encourage us to rethink our goals. God has blessed each and every one of you with some amazing talents. Yours may be intellectually, musically, athletically, relationally, or most likely here at Westmont, a combination of a bunch of those. And God gives us passions that he wants us to pair with our talents to be his hands and feet in the world to impact people for him. But with a national heritage echoing in our heads that achieving prosperity will bring happiness, and a modern culture that screams at us every day through TV, internet, and magazines that it's all about us, it's easy to fall into the trap that I did, only to find that the things of the ways of the world will ultimately leave you unfulfilled. 
So take some time to think. Are your goals and your dreams of eternal value? Are they focused on I, or are they focused on the I am? Are you directing your passions towards what God is passionate about? Believe me, these are questions I have to ask myself too. My bent towards perfectionism hasn't disappeared, and my prideful nature sometimes steals my focus back towards self-centered goals. But I have a coach, a much better coach than I am, the Holy Spirit, who helps to keep me on track. And when I don't have the fruits of the Spirit, I know that I need to recalibrate and remember what I'm working for. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I think that we each have our different warning signals, but for me, the first to go are peace and joy. Pressure and anxiety come in, and peace and joy become a distant memory. And I know when I'm feeling that stress that I need to remember, it's not about me. I'm going to conclude by sharing my most joyous moment of my career with you. It was my senior night, my last game on our home court, and we were playing Cal. We established a big lead, and this time, Coach let me play for more than 30 seconds. But it was in the last minute of the game, our team forced a turnover, and I ran the left lane as the point guard caught the outlet and spotted me wide open on the wing ahead. She heaved the ball up towards me, and the rest is in slow motion, really, like it happened in slow motion. The ball sailing towards me. We had really big crowds at Oregon, 6,000, over 6,000 fans were there, really. And as the ball's coming, I'm wide open there on the wing. All the fans start to stand up, because they know what I do best is I shoot threes. Their anticipations, like their arms are almost already going up, you know, that's the sign for three-point shot, for those of you not basketball people. Um, but just as the ball landed in my hands, out of the corner of my eye, I see one of my teammates streak into the corner, Shannon. Without even hesitating, I caught the ball, swung it over to her in the corner. She shot it, and it swished through the hoop. I will never forget, I still get choked up when I think about it, the look on her face as she jumped up, and pumped her fist in celebration, her smile ear to ear with braces and the lights were like reflecting <laughs> off of her braces. <laughs> you see, Shannon was only a sophomore had only played in a few minutes all season, her whole career, really. And unbeknownst to most people in the gym that night, it was Shannon's last game in Matt Court, too. She had really struggled for two years and was going to transfer to another school. But helping to bring about that moment, to share in Shannon's joy, brought me more joy than if I'd made the shot myself. Getting our eyes off ourselves frees us up to enjoy to the fullest the opportunities that God gives us. So there you have it. A dream is born. A girl works day and night to make her dream come true. It does happen, only she realizes that this can't be all there is to life. God shows her more, that he is the fulfillment of the American dream and his dreams for her are more than she could possibly ask or imagine. And what really excites me about this journey is that the end of this story is really only the beginning of what God has done in me and wants to continue to do in and through me and in all of you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for stories. Each one is unique as you work in our lives in distinct and meaningful ways. I thank you for the way that you have worked in my life to give me meaning beyond myself. 
Help each and every one of us strive for things that have eternal value, to be passionate about the things that you are passionate about. And through it all, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.